This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. It's April 2013, and this is Episode 6, Conversation with an Alien Hunter. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. In this episode, our first real discussion of SETI with one of its leading spokespersons, Seth Shostak. We will also bring you a little music. SETI, S-E-T-I, stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and it dates back about 50 years, when an astronomer named Frank Drake began the first targeted search for signals from another world. Drake estimated that there were many other civilizations in our galaxy capable of radio communication, and that it might be possible to find their signals, particularly if the extraterrestrial civilizations desired to find and communicate with other intelligent species in their galaxy. Since the early days with Frank Drake and Project Ozma, a number of searches have been conducted both at radio and optical wavelengths, and no such signals have been definitively, repeatably located. On August 15th, 1977, a high-energy, apparently extraterrestrial signal was detected by a radio telescope in Delaware, Ohio, for a duration of 72 seconds, coming from the constellation Sagittarius. This became known as the WOW signal because astronomer Jerry Amon wrote the word WOW on the printout showing the signal intensity. All attempts to find this signal a second time came up empty. So to this day, we do not know whether the WOW signal was ET trying to contact us or not. So what do we make of what physicist Paul Davies has called the eerie silence? Does it mean that we truly are alone? As Seth Shostak will discuss, perhaps this silence is not so eerie after all. We have not looked over the entire search space. This search space includes, as a minimum, two dimensions over the celestial sphere, what astronomers call right ascension and declination, frequency, where the signal is on the dial, and time. And time is perhaps the most challenging parameter. Since we have not been able to dwell any search on potential signal sources, because there are just so many radio telescopes in the world and they are expensive facilities being used for astronomy. We look at a candidate star for a short time, see nothing we can justify interpreting as an artificial signal, then move on. And SETI researchers may not visit that star again for quite a long time, possibly many years. In the interview to follow, we mention the Drake Equation. Listeners to Episode 2 and 4 have at least a passing familiarity with this simple formula. The Drake Equation is seven factors that, when multiplied together, estimate the number of civilizations in the galaxy that may be able to communicate with us. We know the first three factors in the Drake Equation reasonably well, and are hard at work on the fourth, although we still don't really know what the fourth one is. However, all four of the last factors are just a guess right now. I will provide a link in the show notes to Seth Shostak's essay on the seventh factor, which is the average lifetime of a technological civilization. Seth Shostak did his undergraduate work at Princeton University in physics and received his Ph.D. from Caltech in astronomy. He is now a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, which also includes such luminaries as Jill Tarter and Frank Drake. 
He is the author of numerous books and articles on SETI in both the popular and professional literature, including the book Confessions of an Alien Hunter. He is also the co-host of the podcast Big Picture Science, which, as I'm sure you recall, was the recipient of the first Wow Signal podcast, podcast seal of approval, back in episode four. I've, you're actually the first SETI expert I've interviewed for this podcast, even though I named it after a SETI event. I'd like to start maybe with just a little bit of history and then move into the past and into the present and the future of SETI. Okay. Uh, it looks like, I think it's this September, it will be the 20th anniversary of Black Wednesday, which is when all federal funding was cut off for SETI. And yet I'm still hearing a lot of people on the internet say, I don't like my money being wasted on SETI. Uh, are you getting the message out that this is purely a, a privately supported effort right now? Well, I I hope that we are. Uh, you know, the reaction when Congress killed NASA's SETI program in October, actually, of uh, 1993, uh, was usually of the ilk that, well, you know, this wasn't a lot of money. I mean, it was costing every taxpayer approximately three or four cents a year. And I think they felt they could part with that, at least for the opportunity to find out whether we're alone or not. Uh, and I, my impression is that many people, the majority of people recognize that ever since that day, all the SETI in this country has been privately funded. Not everybody recognizes that. I mean, maybe one out of four or something don't don't seem to know that. I actually wrote an article for the Huffington Post, which is up there today on their front page about why we do SETI and is it worthwhile. So maybe that'll help to get the message out to a few more people. Who knows? But, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people do recognize that. And even if they don't, most people are not of the opinion that this wouldn't be worth the money because they, they do uh, seem to be aware that it's not a lot of money. So that was about 20 years ago, that, and somehow the SETI Institute has survived, and although there have been some rough sledding lately. Uh, the Allen Telescope Array, I understand now, is, is it is funded and operational. It is. It is operating, and we've, we found uh, an organization that has other uses for it, so they're willing to pay the maintenance. What that means is we don't get to use it 24-7, but we get to use it something like 12-7. <laughs> we get roughly half the observing time on the instrument without having to pay the cost of, of uh, maintenance and operations and so forth. So we only have to pay our own scientists. Uh, to be honest, I think that trade-off is a good one because we're really not in the business of running observatories or shouldn't be. We, we should be in the business of doing this science. So the Allen Telescope Array, is that currently the best instrument on the planet for doing SETI? Well, it depends on the kind of experiment that you're doing. Uh, in general, bigger telescopes are better. I mean, this is just one more human activity where bigger really is better. And there are some SETI experiments being used, or sorry, that are running, that are using the uh, Arecibo telescope, Arecibo radio telescope down in Puerto Rico. Many people have seen that telescope, or at least photos of it, because it's been in a couple of movies. It was in the movie Contact, but it was also in Goldeneye, one of the James Bond films. It's a very impressive instrument. It's a thousand feet across. That's a big antenna. It's the world's mm -hmm. biggest single-dish antenna. And uh, there, there's a uh, University of California at Berkeley project to use that antenna. And of course, that means they have enormous sensitivity because it's such a big antenna. But on the other hand, the downside is they're not really controlling the telescope. They just have a, a, uh, the use of a secondary receiver on that telescope, which means that they can't, you know, determine where they're aiming. It, it's just sort of random. Now, you know, okay, that's the trade-off. You don't get to determine where you're going to look. But on the other hand, wherever you're looking, you're doing so with a lot of sensitivity because you have a big dish. That's the trade-off. Uh, the Allen Telescope Array, on the other hand, we can point it where we want to point it. And we are, in fact, uh, aiming these days at star systems that are being searched by NASA's Kepler telescope, star systems where we suspect there are planets. So, you know, uh, that's good. 
the downside is the collecting area is not as big as Arecibo, so the sensitivity is not as high. So each each experiment has uh, you know its own best, if you will, telescope. That is, that was a that's what uh, forty two reflectors that you have on that. Array? Yes, the Allen Telescope Array these days has forty two elements, forty two antennas, each one about twenty feet across. The design goal was three hundred and fifty antennas. That's what the intention was, but because you know the R and D cost more money than we anticipated the amount of money left over for actually building things was 42. If we can get more money, we can build more. One nice thing about an array is that uh, you can use it even if you don't have it completed. It's it's unlike a, what's called a single-dish antenna, one giant antenna. I mean, if Arecibo, it's a, it's a single-dish antenna. It's one giant <laughs> reflector, okay? And, it you know, you really couldn't use it until it was complete. I mean, until it was finished, it was of no use, and then suddenly it was of great use. But with an array, you can build, you know, some of the elements of the array and connect them together, and you get uh, you, you get something useful, even though it's not finished. So, uh, yes, we only have forty two antennas now. We're hoping for more. Is there so there is hope that there will be more antennas? Oh yeah, I mean there would be more antennas there in six months if somebody would write a check. Uh, let's, I'll put it very blatantly, but that's the case. <laughs> it's it's yeah. about the money, and it's sad yeah. that it's about the money because the total amount of money we're talking about here is. You know, compared to most most science, in fact, compared to a lot of things, is is not a, a great deal of money. But on the other hand, it has to be raised privately, and so uh, it's it's hard to find it. You mentioned that you're currently observing uh, planets that have been discovered by Kepler. What what's the process for determining what you observe and and how much time you devote to it? Yeah, well, that's that's a decision that's made. Uh, you know, by the scientists involved, after all. I mean, we have several projects running sort of in parallel, but uh, the, the principal one is indeed to look at the Kepler candidates, as they're called. Kepler, which is an orbiting telescope uh, designed to answer a very straightforward and simple question, namely, what fraction of stars have planets that are somewhat like the Earth? We don't know that. We know that there are a lot of planets out there. In fact, we know today that most most stars have planets, so there are a lot of planets out there. But, you know, what fraction of them are like the Earth? Is that 1% or 0.1% or 10% or 0.001%? Nobody knows. Kepler is designed to answer that. But in the meantime, Kepler has already unearthed, although that's maybe not the right verb here. <laughs> it's unearthed, uh, you know, something like 2,700 or 2,800 planet candidates. These are star systems where they think there is a planet, and probably 80 or 90 percent of those will turn out to be true detections. Uh, there will be some false positives there. But So, you know, more than 2,000 planetary systems. So those are star systems where we absolutely know that there are planets, and so what we do is we, uh, we look in those directions when we can. You know, when, when uh, that particular part of the sky is, has set, it's gone, you know, below the horizon for a while, then we look at nearby star systems that are thought to be the right kind to uh, possibly house some life. Among the Kepler candidates, are you focusing on those that have planets in the so-called Goldilocks zone? Or well, there aren't very planets? many of those. I mean, you know, they're on the order of uh, 10 or 20 of them that are sort of in the habitable zone, as it's called, the Goldilocks zone, if you're a fan of uh, feeding uh, ursine's soup. But, you know, it's... Uh, but that's such a small number. Of course, we look at all of those that we can. I mean, some of them are in the deep southern hemisphere where we can't reach them with our instrument. But, mm -hmm. of course, we look at those. But we, we look at other uh, star systems, too, that are known to have planets, but not necessarily what would be considered habitable planets. Because although, you know, the, the planets that have been found around those stars might be too hot or too cold, they, they could have other planets. At least you, you know they have planets. The I, I read a recent study in which some of your colleagues um, looked at some red dwarf planets, uh, red, planets around red dwarfs, and uh, they also uh, I think this was in two thousand and seven it came out seventy five something like seventy five percent of all the star systems in the galaxy are red dwarfs, mm -hmm. and maybe even in higher percentage than that, but it's true. There are a lot of red dwarfs. I'm a great fan. I'm, I'm trying to get more of a red dwarf uh, presence in our observations myself uh, because, uh, because I think that they, they offer many advantages from the standpoint of if you're going to look for ET, you know, where should you look? I mean, to begin with, as you point out, the majority of stars are red dwarfs. Nothing strange about that. I mean, the majority of animals are small ones. Uh, so that the fact that the majority of stars are also small is not surprising. Nature tends to make more of small things than of big things. 
And uh, so that means that if you're looking, if you only have time to look at, I don't know what, a thousand star systems, if you pick red dwarfs, if those are good candidates, then on average, they're going to be closer, right? They're, they're just going to be closer because there's so many more of them, all right? It's sort of like uh, fast food restaurants. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're likely to be closer to where you live than, uh, you know, a Michelin five-star restaurant, of which there are far fewer. So it's, it's a, it has that advantage. If they're closer, of course, any signals they're broadcasting will be stronger and easier to find. The second thing is they live for a very long time. Uh, red dwarf stars are, you know, live for tens and tens of and billions of years. So every red dwarf ever born is still shining out there in the cosmos. And that means that they've had more time to cook up uh, not just life, but intelligent life. Uh, because they're on average, they're older than stars like the sun. So all those uh, factors seem to me to suggest that red dwarfs are really a good bet. So the, we think there is a reasonable habitable zone for a red dwarf? Yeah, people didn't used to think that. There was a, a time not very long ago when people said, look, the, the problem with red dwarfs is that they're dim bulbs. As stars go, they're, they're putting out you know, only a fraction of the, uh, the light, the heat, if you will, but the light that the sun puts out. And consequently, any, any planet that's going to be able to have life, it's got to be warm enough so that all the liquids on the surface don't just freeze up. So it's going to have to be a planet that happens to be very close in to that star even closer than Mercury is to the sun. All right, well, there are such planets. That's not a problem, but the, the thought was if they're that close in, then something happens to them. They get what's called tidally locked. And uh, <laughs> that, that sounds like some sort of exquisite form of torture, but what it really means is that uh, very quickly one side of that planet is, is uh, always facing the star. Okay, it's not rotating relative to the star uh, any faster than once per year. So it's like the moon. Right, the moon rotates once a month. In other words, right. one side of the moon always faces the Earth. We all know that. Well, the same thing would be true of these planets. And, and the assumption was, well, you can rule that planet out. It's not going to have ET because one side is going to be too hot and the other side is going to be too cold. And on the cold side, the atmosphere will just, you know, freeze out. It'll just drop onto the surface of the planet like snow and uh, you won't have any atmosphere. Uh, it turns out none of that's true. Well, some of it's true, but I mean, it isn't as bad as it seems. Because, in fact, winds will carry the heat from the hot side to the cold side sufficiently to make sure that the atmosphere stays in place. And certain areas around sort of, if you will, the, uh, the zone between the hot and the cold, it's obviously got to be, you know, the kind of nice temperatures we enjoy here in lovely California. So uh, people have changed their minds about the habitability of uh, planets around red dwarfs. I'd like to uh, talk a bit about some of the... Uh the, the uh, ideas behind SETI, because I, I often encounter a lot of, uh, on the Internet, a lot of controversy about what, you know, why, why we're even looking and why we're looking in radio and uh, what we expect to find. And can we start, let's start with radio. And I, and I mentioned SETI to a lot of people, they say, well, radio has got to be too primitive for an advanced civilization. Why would we be listening in radio? Yeah. Well, there are good reasons we listen to radio. It isn't just history, uh, although there may be some component of it that is history. If we had invented lasers before we invented radio, maybe all, you know, the majority of all SETI would be uh, op what's called optical SETI. In other words, looking for flashing laser lights in the sky. We do that, too. But, you know, the radio has uh, precedence and we do a lot more of that. Uh, but there, there are advantages to radio. To begin with, radio communications, of course, go at the speed of light. And as far as we know, that's the best you can do. So they're certainly fast enough. They're also cheap. They're cheap in the sense that uh, radio photons, you know, the, uh, the, the particles, the wave-like particles that carry the information in radio are a lot less expensive in terms of the energy required to make them than uh, photons of light. Okay, so, you know, that, that gives them a certain advantage. I mean, it's cheaper. If you want to send bits of information from one star system to another, uh, radio might be the cheapest way to do it, particularly if you want to broadcast it and not, you know, just send it to one direction, but you want to send it to a whole swath of the galaxy because you've got all these paid listeners or whatever, <laughs> you know, radio might be the better way to do it. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's not to say that there, are other, there aren't other ways of communication, uh, like light and so forth. It's only to say that radio makes sense and it probably will always make sense for some sorts of communication in the same way that, you know, the wheel's an old invention too. 
but you know, I look out the window here, and there are a lot of things with wheels, so it's still right. being used. Yeah, and and it seems to me like our civilization has got even more locked into radio in the last just last decade. With yeah, we keep finding new new uses for for radio. Yep. Sure. And, and not only that, but we seem to be more dependent on it. I mean, I don't, I never plug my computer into Ethernet anymore. I just have Wi-Fi. Yeah, the trouble with that is it, uh, it's going to be hard to hear ET's Wi-Fi because it's pretty low power. <laughs> right. Um, so and now, you, you need the code. <laughs> yeah. In your book, uh, when you were talking about UFOs, you argued that an advanced civilization would be un- there'd be unlikely to be any advanced civilizations that would know we are here. And by mm-hmm. we, I mean a radio capable civilization uh, because it just hasn't been enough time since we started radiating. Um, so we're looking for someone who doesn't know we're here, but still knows how to communicate with us. Is that, I mean, have you considered that you obviously don't consider that an insuperable obstacle. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting point because traditionally SETI's looked for signals that, you know, they're always on. We, we, we find something in the sky and we go back on two minutes later and it's still there. And we go, you know, so we keep looking at it and five minutes later it's still there and in an hour later it's still there and we call up people at another observatory and they, they get to it the next day and they find that it's still there. And, you know, we had to go through all of that before you'd call a press conference and say, well, folks, uh, guess what? So, that assumes that the extraterrestrials have some interest in relentlessly pinging our world, or at least uh, sending <laughs> radio broadcasts in our direction. Maybe they're not really aimed at us, but we just happen to be in the way. I mean, that I, I agree with you that that might be a problem, because if they don't know we're here, why would they target Earth, right? Uh, I, I can hardly imagine why they would target Earth nonstop, because it's expensive to do that. But there's this. They would know that there's life on Earth because they could have uh, just looked at life. Uh, sorry, look at our uh, our planet with an optical telescope, a mirror and lens telescope, and they would see the uh, the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere because it makes a spectral signature that they could easily find. So they know there's oxygen in our atmosphere and uh, and methane, and those are sort of giveaways for the fact that there's biology here. So they would know there's biology. That's an old signal. It's been going into space for two billion years the methane and the oxygen. It's mm-hmm. length of time we've had a lot of oxygen in our atmosphere. So they've known for a long time there's life here. They wouldn't know that there's intelligent life here because we haven't been broadcasting that news for very long. But knowing that there's life here, they might say, okay, well, you know what, Zork? Uh, we don't know if there's anybody down there or not, but we could send them a ping you know, every two weeks for a, you know, a fraction of a second along with uh, 10 million other worlds that we know have life. <laughs> we'll ping them all and maybe some of them will get back to us. And so, you know, we really need to improve our SETI experiments so we could find such intermittent uh, attempts to get in touch because I think that uh, that might be the likely form that uh, such signals would take. Now, normally in the past you've looked for just a simple unmodulated carrier, right? just a, a spike in the spectrum. Right. Uh, but have you thought about I – no, I know you have thought about Benford Beacons and other uh, types of – Pulsed approaches. Which yeah, well, have- well, pulsing is. I mean, pul- pulsing, unless it's very intermittent. If you say, "Here's a pulse," and then, by the way, two years from now, you'll get a second pulse. That that's a little different than saying I'm going to pulse it once a second or ten times a second or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure why you would pulse it. You know, <laughs> once every second or once every ten seconds, except that it makes it a little bit easier to recognize that it's an artificial signal. But, you know, look, if they're going to send a signal uh, in this direction, either it has essentially no information except, hey, here's a ping. So, you know, it's a fraction of a second, ping, and that's it. Or if it's a little longer than that, then they're going to put some modulation on some message, you know. So they'll send a a bunch of pictures or here's our mailing address or (laughs) here's our our email address, whatever. They're going to send that, and that means that the the signal, of course, is changing very, very rapidly because it it will be modulated. That will be hard for us to find. But, you know, I I, I don't quite know what we can do other than to try and think of ways in which we could recognize a one-off, the kind of signal that's on for a 
brief flash, like like a wow signal, if you will. Not to say that the wow signal was ET, but something like that, a signal that appears once and and not again for who knows how long, weeks, months, hours, years, whatever, because that's not an unreasonable assumption as to what they might be doing. Since we, they don't know, well, they, they would know that we have life in our planet. Uh, certainly anybody who's sophisticated astronomers would be able to build a telescope that would detect that, at least probably thousands of light years away if they're really advanced. Um, but they don't know that, that we're radio capable. So, as you mentioned, they might just send a pulse to in, any of millions of possible candidate worlds. Yeah. Um, so, is there a way, I mean, the, what you really have to do is just to say this pulse can't possibly be natural, right? Yes. That's really what you're trying to get at. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing in nature like a pulsar or something like that that could create a signal like this. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, I read in your, I read in your um, book uh, the chapter about how you thought once you might have detected something and you were sitting there for, I guess, a couple of days thinking you might have detected something. Uh, and it turned out to be a satellite. But the, you know, isn't it a lot more likely that we would see something very infrequently, like the wow signal? Well, I mean, as to say, this is all second-guessing ET's strategy. And right. uh, the facts are we don't really know. I mean, it is second-guessing, and it's just based on what seems reasonable to us at the time. Yeah, we and, just kind of have to and, and, and that sounds reasonable to me. It certainly at this time it does, yes. We should yeah. be looking for an intermittent signal. And, you know, you've already kind of suggested that's not easy. Right. I mean, if you see it once, how do you know that that was, you know, not something natural, a gamma ray burst or something? Well, there are various tests you could do. You could see, look, did it appear only at uh, one frequency or is it over a wide band of frequencies? Because nature tends to make signals that can be fairly short. A gamma ray burst might be fairly short, but and it's completely natural. But it's at, you know, many. It's all over the band. It's all over the dial. So if you find something that's not all over the dial, if you have the equipment to, you know, look simultaneously in different frequencies and you find it's only here you know maybe that's a, that's a telltale sign but it's very difficult because there's a lot of interference from earth that has those same sorts of characteristics right. and you got to rule that out well let okay let me get you to talk about detecting um an advanced civilization um it's not trying to communicate with us is there any hope for that well there might be I mean, <laughs> there, there are plenty of other critters here on the planet, very few of whom are actually trying to communicate with us. Maybe your dog or cat is, but, you know, in general, when, yeah. I, when I go to Africa, though, the rhinos, the giraffes, the rhinos, they're not really trying to communicate with me. <laughs> uh, so, and yet we, we can detect their presence, okay? So it's, it's quite possible, it seems to me, that we could, you know, we could find evidence for their existence, even though they're not really trying to get in touch. I mean, there are lots of obvious ways to do that. If you were to you know, a spy, some astro engineering, as it's called, just big construction projects. Keep in mind, the universe, it's three times older than the Earth. So, you know, there are going to be societies out there that have been around, unless societies routinely self-destruct, which is possible. But otherwise, there'll be societies out there that could be billions of years more advanced than we are. Not millions, but billions. That's a long time. And it's hard to say what a society a billion years more advanced than ours might be able to do. I mean, maybe they're able to rearrange stuff in their solar system, build giant habitats, big assemblies of solar cells, who knows, something that even from the distance of light years might still be detectable by just, if you will, conventional a astronomy. I mean, just people studying the sky have no interest in ET, but suddenly they trip across some big construction project uh, seen, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 light years away. That's not impossible. The same is true with the SETI experiments. We may pick up a signal that really wasn't intended to get in touch with anybody. It just happens to be a big signal that they're blasting out for who knows what reason, but that we can pick up. Right. Yeah. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be talking to uh, Duncan Forgan, who wrote a paper on detecting uh, asteroid mining leftovers uh, using infrared astronomy. Uh, it. The SETI Institute. I know you. You. You uh, really. You look at the whole spectrum of possibilities. It's not just radio. Uh, although I know your own background is as a radio astronomer, but uh, is is it possible that the real future for SETI might be in piggybacking on 
infrared astronomy? Well, there could be. There certainly have been some efforts, actually, already. Some people have looked for what are called Dyson swarms, big swarms of solar cells orbiting somebody else's star. Uh, The people who have a need for power, people that are really power hungry, they want to collect some some more of the power coming off their star without producing any pollution or anything like that. So they just have these big phalanx of solar satellites, if you will, orbiting around in their solar system, beaming uh, the energy back to whatever planet they're on. And uh, that would inevitably produce a lot of infrared radiation because these things would warm up. So if you looked at a star system and you found, gosh, too much infrared here, that infrared can't be coming from the star. The star star wouldn't put out that much infrared. You would say, you know, that could be the indication of a a power-happy society. The problem with that, and so people have looked through infrared data on stars to see if there are stars like this that have what's called an infrared excess, and they found some. But the, but the difficulty is there are also stars that have a lot of dust around them, uh, as our own star did, you know, four, billion, uh, four and a half billion years ago. And that dust also heats up and produces a lot of infrared. So you have to be careful not to be fooled by natural phenomena. Right. And this, I think that's an ongoing problem with SETI, right, is you, nature puts out signals all over the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So. Well, that's not so much a problem in the radio because we're looking for narrow band radio signals. And nature does not produce very many narrow band radio signals. So uh, that, that's less of a problem in the radio. But in the, in the optical, when you're you know, looking with a mirror and lens telescope and you see too much infrared, you, know, uh, you, you don't want to jump to the conclusion, ha ha, I found their technology. When in fact, maybe all you found was a whole lot of you know. <laughs> dust around their star. That would be embarrassing, yes, to come out with that conclusion prematurely. Um, now, as you mentioned, we're kind of second-guessing. We don't really know what would motivate another civilization, and even if they would have a word for motivation, <laughs> we, or even if they would have words. Uh, do we... But are there any general principles that we think we can adopt the, for example, would any advanced civilization master the electromagnetic spectrum, for example? Well, I don't know that anyone would. I mean, all you can do is look for uh, analogies here on Earth, and you look at, uh, you know, the number of societies that uh, existed on Earth a hundred years ago, and there were many, and very few of them actually came up with radio, but it was good enough that, you know, one or two of them did, okay? So, uh, there were pl- plenty, of, plenty of cultures just never got into science, not until science got into them, as it were. I mean, you know, so uh, that, that, that question remains unresolved. I mean, there, there, maybe there are you know, worlds where the uh, inhabitants are happy to just, uh, you know, pick some berries and, uh, and tell stories at night. And maybe that's all they do. But, you know, and that, that was certainly true for Homo sapiens for the first almost 200,000 years of its existence. But eventually, you know, we stumbled onto technology, and of course that leads to understanding physics. That was the real point, that we began to understand how science works, and then we discovered the electromagnetic spectrum. But I think that the, the, the bottom line is this. Maybe a 9 out of 10 societies never get that far, but you, you, won't, you won't hear from those guys. Those aren't the right. ones you're going to hear from. Right. Well, that leads me to, um, well... I know you don't necessarily agree that we are, we, we are um, experiencing a great silence. We haven't really covered the search space very well yet. But uh, if we do cover the search space well, and there still is no detection of an ET anywhere, what, what would you conclude from that? Well, to begin with, we're a very long way from that. I mean, to say there's an eerie silence is to say that you know, you've, you've sailed uh, 20 miles south of Tierra del Fuego, and you haven't found Antarctica, and so consequently there's no Antarctica. In eerie absence, that would be. But, you know, it's, it's kind of a premature conclusion. We, there's no eerie silence. We just haven't, haven't looked very much. But if, indeed, you were able to, you know, look over a reasonably wide range of frequencies with reasonably good sensitivity at you know, uh, in, in the direction of a million star systems and, and still didn't find anything. And by the way, that kind of an experiment we should be able to do in the next 20 years. But if, if it turns out that comes up dry, uh, I don't know that you'd ever get me to say, well, they're not out there because that just seems so bizarre. But that's my personal predilections. I think what I would say is this is the wrong experiment. That's probably what I would say. We should think again. 
Well, I know you you wrote an article a few years ago about the last term in the Drake equation, L. You thought it's it could either be very small or very large. Uh, there's probably that there there could could be some long lived civilizations out there, but if they're not long lived, we would we'd be a lot less likely to see anybody, right? Well, so. yeah, but I mean that's just essentially the Drake equation, which is designed to sort of estimate how many uh, societies are out there that are broadcasting signals we could be picking up today. And obviously, if they if they develop radio and then a hundred years later they develop the A bomb and then you know, 100 years after that, they blow themselves away. You're not going to hear anybody because they're, they're only around broadcasting for a couple of hundred years. That's pretty short. Uh, so, you know, it, clearly, how long a uh, technological society not only continues to exist, but continues to broadcast, those are, those are important terms. We have no idea about that. I mean, it, it seems to me that more or less at the time you invent radio, you invent computers, certainly within 100, within 100 years. And maybe within a couple of hundred years after that, you invent artificial intelligence. And I think that fundamentally changes the name of the game. Uh, so it's, it becomes very difficult to speculate on how long-lived artificial intelligence might be and whether it would even use radio. Your solution to the Fermi paradox, then, is it's not a paradox, right? You say you just have, we haven't looked enough. Oh, yeah. No, the, the Fermi paradox is slightly different. I mean, the Fermi paradox is not really SETI. And the Fermi right. paradox simply says there's just no obvious evidence that the, the whole galaxy is colonized and there's been plenty of time for that to have happened. But, you know, the Fermi paradox is a very big conclusion based on a very, very local observation. You know, I don't see any aliens here uh, in Northern California and they've had time to get here. So, uh, you know, that must tell me they're not out there. Well, it might be telling you that. It might not be. <laughs> well, if I was going to find aliens, I'd look at Northern California first, but... <laughs> there might be some um, here. I don't know. <laughs> I wish there would, there would be job security for me. Um, well, the the um, okay, yeah, I agree that Fermi paradox is more about colonization, but it also kind of applies to, at least to some extent, to the fact that we haven't got any radio detection yet. I mean, it, you could you could believe that there should be signals everywhere, but well, maybe. But again, then you're back to the fact that we haven't really looked very. You know, very extensively, the the number of star systems that we've looked at very carefully is on the order of one or two thousand. That's pretty small. Yeah, so, so I, a paper and, came out, I think, I think it was just a few months ago, in which um, one of some of your colleagues said that they had searched a small part of the radio spectrum on some of the Kepler candidates and found nothing. And I got a lot of people reacting to that. See, there's no aliens there. <laughs> Yeah, go, well, well it's like, it's like a a Mark Twain's death. Yeah. The, the, the reports may be premature. Yeah, yeah well, they, they search like, a, a, I think, between one and two gigahertz, and so not even that all that. Mm -hmm. that was, yeah, no, this was done by the Berkeley Group, I think, using the, uh, the new telescope at Green Bank. It's called the GBT, the Green Bank Telescope. Very yeah, ingeniously it named. Yeah. <laughs> it's at Green Bank, West Virginia. Lovely instrument. Anyhow, they used it for a couple of weeks to look at the Kepler candidates and didn't find anything. And and they they decided that that told them something about how uh, uh, plentiful strong yeah. sources in the sky are. Mind you, I, I think that depends on a lot of things that you have to guess. But in any yeah, case, they didn't come up with that. statistical conclusion at best. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well... And we should point out, I think most of my listeners know this, but Kepler is only looking at a small patch of the sky. It's not looking everywhere. That's correct, yes. And it's only looking at star systems that are oriented in the right direction so we can actually see them eclipse. But, well, I mean, it, those are the only ones where it'll, it will detect planets. Of course, it's looking at all the stars in the field, which is like about 150, 160,000. And uh, you would assume that on the order of 1% or 2% of them will be oriented the right way so we could see planets cross in front of their stars if, uh, if they have them. Yes. So um, I just want to have a couple more questions. Uh, I think you've covered a lot of the ground uh, that I wanted to ask you about. Um, the, the, we talked about the intent of... of possible civilizations that we're just guessing on that. We talked about the lifetime. We talked about their use of radio 
um, and that there may be some civilizations that don't use radio, but we'll never see them. Um, you talked about red dwarfs. Uh, we, we, you mentioned the fact that our atmosphere pretty much gives away the existence of life on this planet. Um, so, but one thing that you that you're pretty well known for is is a fair bit of optimism about detecting ET in the next um, generation or so. Yes. Uh, could, you, could you sort of run, give us the nutshell of why you're optimistic? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic because of the following argument. I mean, uh, people do ask all the time, you guys have been at this for a while, so, hey, <laughs> when are you going to find ET? I mean, you're just going to keep uh, doing this for, forever for the next thousand years? And uh, there, there's some practitioners who say, yes, it might take a very long time. And, you know, one must admire their caution because, after all, maybe it will. Uh, maybe it'll take an infinite amount of time. That would be even worse. But I, I liken this to finding a needle in a haystack, right? You've got this haystack and you want to know, uh, you know, when are you going to find a needle in it? And the answer to that depends on only three things. How big is the haystack? How fast are you going through the hay? And how many needles are in there? And we know two of the three for SETI. We know how big the haystack is. It's just the galaxy. And we know how fast we're going through the hay. That's how fast our SETI experiments are combing through cosmic static looking for a signal. And by the way, that uh, that speed uh, keeps increasing. In fact, it's been increasing more or less exponentially for a while now. So it's increasing very quickly. That's uh, mostly computer technology. What we don't know, of course, is how many needles are in the hay. But if you look at you know the estimates made by people who sort of set up the SETI enterprise, people like Frank Drake or Carl Sagan, they estimated somewhere between 10,000 and a million societies are out there broadcasting right now. It's, those are total guesses. Nobody knows. It was just what these people thought was reasonable. But if the truth is also reasonable by their definition, if the truth lies b- between a few thousand and a few million, uh, then, then uh, you can do the calculation and we're going to find ET in the next couple of dozen years. That's it. Now, it could be that they're wrong, in which case we won't find them. Uh, and and uh, in, the, in that case, we're doing the wrong experiment. I understand. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, one more question, and that is, um, I know you get asked a lot of the same questions over and over again. What's the question that people don't ask you that you wish they did? Um, well, sometimes they do come up with uh, questions that are very ingenious and always strike me as uh, interesting. I'll tell you, you know, it, it's a question that I have, and nobody ever comments on it. Well, unless I prod them. And that is, why is this so much, overwhelmingly, an American endeavor? Why is it that other countries in the world which have the equipment, the money, and the talent to do SETI searches in general don't? There are very few exceptions. Very few. Italy today is the only other country besides the United States doing this. And, you know, it's not an expensive experiment. There's plenty of equipment to do it at all the major countries of the world, all the ones that you're likely to go to on your next vacation. So uh, uh, what I want to know is what is it about America's, I don't know, uh, cultural attitudes that make SETI something that with, dif- with difficulty is able to occur here, but that so many other countries don't find worth the effort? Hmm. I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> no, I don't either. That's why I ask it. I, I've, I've lived abroad. I lived in Europe for uh, 13 years, and uh, I asked the people there why, why this was, and they didn't have a very good answer for me. But it was clearly cultural. It's cultural. Well, Seth, thanks for your time. I've enjoyed it. I think you've enlightened my audience quite a bit about SETI, and um, I appreciate that very much. Well, Paul, it's been my pleasure, and uh, thank you for uh, talking with me. Okay. Well, thank you. Bye. Bye. I appreciate Seth Shostak's willingness to express his doubts, as well as optimism about SETI. As he said more than once, maybe we are performing the wrong experiment by looking for a signal in the electromagnetic spectrum. Perhaps there is another way to search for ET that we haven't even thought of yet. When the most vigorous proponents of an enterprise like SETI express reasonable doubt, that is a good sign. Not, as some might think, a bad sign. When people proclaim that there is no doubt whatever 
that their program will succeed or that their claims will be established, that is a strong red flag that they are headed down a rabbit hole, if not already ensconced in one. Science works with the best knowledge we have and branches out from there, always applying tough tests to new ideas to see if they fit, and never claiming final, absolute truth. Big conceptual leaps in science are rare, and even when they do occur, they are rooted in the best knowledge from past research. So, we keep searching in the electromagnetic spectrum. If you have a better idea, I'm sure we'd all like to hear it, but if you are not prepared for tough questions, best to remain silent. I think SETI is a worthwhile endeavor. If you agree, then perhaps you might want to consider supporting the SETI Institute. Any amount will help. I'll have a link in the show notes for just that purpose. And now, the WOW Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. The third WOW Signal Podcast Seal of Approval for Podcasting is awarded to The Weekly Wienersmith. The Weekly Wienersmith is hosted by Kelly and Zach Wienersmith. Kelly is a biologist working on her PhD in parasitology, which I think is a weird supernatural take on sitting. And Zach is best known as the perpetrator of Saturday morning breakfast cereal, the witty, irreverent, and very geeky webcomic. This is one of the smartest, geekiest podcasts you will come across. Production values are modest, and the podcast usually just consists of Kelly and Zach talking about science, though they will often have a guest on, often someone who is trying to crowdfund their research. Often they go into depth in a, to a recent scientific paper they have both read, with cogent and sometimes critical comments. I will have a link to the weekly Wienersmith in the show notes, and hopefully you can visit them and download and listen, maybe even subscribe. You have just heard the Wow Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Okay, I have been using the beginning, the middle, and the end of Jason Robinson's composition, Radiate, but I have yet to play the whole thing all the way through. Permit me to remedy that right now. Here's the scorching jazz track by Jason Robinson, Radiate.
Well, maybe I should have called that the Growling, Snarling Jazz Track by Jason Robinson, Radiate. If you want to comment on this episode, or any episode of the Wow Signal podcast, you can leave a comment on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com, or join our Google Plus community. If you want to be on the podcast, just email me at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com, and we can discuss this. As always, I want to incorporate listener comments and questions as part of the podcast. You can still be the first to take me up on this. I would also like to hear from you if you are a musician and would like me to play some of your music on the podcast. Just email me at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and let me know how I can listen to your work. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Wow Signal Podcast. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Shostak, our musical contributors, Jason Robinson, Alucha Tistas, John Baez and Greg Egan, and our voiceover artists, Joyce Abma and Aaron Carr. And now, here's Jason Robinson again with the title track from his album Tyresian Symmetry to take us out. This has been Episode 6 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of the WOW Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. All music is presented with the permission of the artists. To comment on this episode, or for more information about SETI, the Drake Equation, or the music in this podcast, please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Wow.